I want to begin by just letting you know and, and sharing with you, I am jacked up. I am excited. I am thrilled. Um, as the Pennsylvania Dutch would say, Wannick Besserver Konik Nikstanda, which means if I was any better, I couldn't stand it. Because it is absolutely, oh, I can't even believe you're, you're not catching on already what's happening. Because in 163 days, 14 hours, 37 minutes, and 33 seconds, no, 32, nope, 31 seconds, guess what's coming? Christmas, yes, absolutely. And since we're in July, Christmas in July, what better time than to realize and to plan ahead, Christmas is coming. One of my absolute favorite times of the year, and I hope it's one of your absolute favorite times of the year as well. Now, one of the great things about Christmas, for some of you and for others, it's something that you may despise about Christmas, is the giving and receiving of gifts. How many of you like the giving and receiving of gifts at Christmas? Okay, how many of you are willing to confess it, right? Okay, there you go. So with the, and we've studied this before, the five love languages, all right? Uh, such, uh, each and every one of us has at least one default position about how we um, appreciate love, how we give and receive love. For some of you, it's words of affirmation. Great job. Hey, I care so much about you. That's what means a lot. For others, it's uh, acts of service, what you do for other people. For others of you still, it's Time is your primary expression of love, what you do with another person. Of course, there's physical touch, whether it's like high five, shoulder rubs, hugs, holding hands, uh, whatever. And then a fifth one, and for some of you, it is the giving and receiving of gifts. But that is your love language. And so this is what can mean so much for you at Christmas is, of course, the giving and receiving of gifts. Because for you, or at least someone you really care about, that is their primary love language. So, for example, our middle child, Stephanie, this is her primary love language, giving and receiving and receiving of gifts. So her love language and mine are, are really opposite. So it's, it's work for me to ask my wife, can you get something for her for her birthday or Christmas? Think about that for a moment, right? Because I really stink when it comes to getting gifts for other people. I'm just not, I've never been good at it. I'm just not good at it because it is far from being my primary love language. But for other people, it's spot on. It's your default position. And where am I going with this is quite simply that what Dot shared with us in the reading from Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, we have in this letter some really awesome, amazing stuff about what God has gifted to you. In fact, he uses the term inheritance. So you may or may not realize that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and sealed with the Holy Spirit, and marked with the cross of Christ forever, that you have an inheritance. And one of the really cool things about this inheritance is no taxes, don't have to go through the courts or attorneys. Uh, there's no concern about the family politics and dynamics and people getting ticked off and all that. And it's totally free because Christ has already paid for it on the cross and with the empty tomb. And so Paul shares with us these words, in Christ. And again, this is Paul's code language. Anytime you see Paul say, in Christ, in him, through him, this is his way of talking about salvation, in Christ. And 12 times in this short reading that we have from Ephesians, 12 times in just a very few verses, Paul uses the expression, in Christ, through Christ, in him. He's talking about redemption, which is mentioned twice in this letter, of salvation. This is our inheritance that your inheritance is in Christ. It is the gift of salvation, of what he has done for you and for me. But the thing becomes, what does that inheritance actually look like? And he links it to the word redemption, salvation. So if we don't get the understanding of in Christ or in him or through him, he doubles it up by saying, well, by the way, this also means redemption, salvation. 
But what does that really look like for you and I when it talks about the gifts that God gives to you? Not just at Christmas, not just at Easter, but every day of your life as a follower of the Lord. And so let's, we're just going to do a brief snippet on this because this could really take a long time. I'm not going to do that. What we are going to do is just an incredibly brief synopsis of these verses on what exactly are the gifts from God to the people of God. And so what Paul shares with us is right off the get-go about blessing. Three times he uses this word blessing. It's like beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And what Paul wants us to understand is that when you are a follower of Jesus, when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbors, you love yourself, we have this incredible blessing of all the heavenly places that you and I are blessed by God. Now, how God does that and how God chooses to do that, that's up to God. But the bottom line is that you and I are blessed by God. Now, what an awesome thing that is. Think about when you were growing up. Wouldn't it mean a whole lot to you when you were trying to receive a blessing from your mom or your dad, or if it wasn't from them, maybe an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, in which you knew that you were accepted by them, you were loved by them, they had your best interest in mind, and that they would do anything in the world for you to be blessed. And that's one of the things that Paul is trying to help us understand, that by our heavenly Father, the only perfect parent that is out there, that he blesses you and me as lovers of the Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So not only are we blessed, but we are holy and blameless before Jesus in the last day. And quite honestly, this, this happens now within this lifetime. Isn't that something to stand before God, knowing that, well, yeah, we got all these guilty as charged, guilty as charged, guilty as charged, guilty as charged, if they are to do a record throughout our life for the times in which we were not exactly angels. And yet what we are being told is that time will come, that as we stand before the Almighty, we will be considered holy and blameless. In so many ways that, that begins now already, but not in its fullness until the last time. We have uh, one of our folks after the eight o'clock service uh, said, well, don't you realize, uh, and you could really spend a little more time in what is called the doctrine of imputed righteousness. Now, you probably don't understand what that means, but it was a very accurate descriptive because what is being said here when Paul talks about how you and I will be, and to some degree now, considered holy and blameless before God, it means the doctrine of imputed or accredited or reckoned righteousness. And what that means is essentially that what Christ has done for you is he paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. In other words, Christ took upon himself our sin, our unfaithfulness, our unlovingness, he put that on himself on the cross and exchanged that, that we could be people of God and of love and hope and of faith. Martin Luther called this the doctrine of happy exchange in which Jesus exchanged our sinfulness for his righteousness. In the book of Romans in the fourth chapter, and I was reminded of this this morning. So for example, as, as Paul shares with us, uh, talking about Abraham and how Abraham uh, and with the circumcision and how being the doctrine, the explanation of uncircumcision and circumcision in this and how faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. It says right here in uh, verse 11 of chapter four, and he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be imputed or credited to them. What Paul wants us to understand is Jesus has done this amazing thing for you and for I that we may live for him. 
So let's continue. What are the, what are the gifts that God has granted to us? The next one in verse 5 talks about being adopted. We are adopted children of God. Because of what Jesus has done for you and for taking our sin on him and giving us his holiness and righteousness, that we are also adopted by our Lord. Now, this is an amazing thing. Some of you may be adopted or you have adopted kids or you have someone in your family who has been adopted. And when we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever, and baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, those are our adoption papers. And so we know then beyond a shadow of a doubt that part of our inheritance is that you are indeed, have the assurance and the security of knowing that you are a child of God. And the Almighty claims you as his very own. As imperfect as we are, in times in which we please the Lord, in times in which we do not please our Lord, how he still loves you and me anyways. Also then is forgiveness, another blessing that comes. This is what redemption looks like, part of our inheritance. Because in forgiveness, whatever the toxic shame or the guilt, or whatever it is of our past, and knowing that Christ's death and resurrection and the holiness that is imputed upon us in exchange for our sin. And here we see then that forgiveness sets us free, that we can start new and afresh each and every day. Good heavens, folks. If, if Jesus can forgive the people that we saw him forgive in the New Testament, and some of them that you would think were just totally unforgivable, and good heavens, he can forgive you as well. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, how could God ever forgive a person like me? Well, yeah, Jesus died for you so that you could be forgiven. This is descriptive of how great a God you have come here to worship this morning. And the final thing is you've been hearing throughout part of that inheritance is the promise and seal and pledge of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God's presence living within you. So these are the gifts that God has granted to you. This is the inheritance that you receive as a follower of Christ. So God's great gifts for you. But then we also need to ask, so what is God's, what is your great gift to God? And he continues with verse 12. Paul goes, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. This is what God calls us to do and to be each and every day, and that is to glorify our God. You have a family name, and you take that family name seriously. And you don't want to bring shame on the family name. You want to bring honor to the family name. You want to make it a good family name. You want to make it a reputable family name. You want it to be a family name that people honor and recognize. And yeah, that's a good family. Not a perfect family, but it's a good family. And we are being asked to do the same with our God. To bring honor to our God. To be pleasing to God. To glorify our God. So that not only is our God praised and people look upon our God as what a God. And whatever you have in your life, I want some of that as well. And it's a great opportunity then in which we are able to share what is so great about our God. And the blessings and the gifts that come from our God. And that we can therefore in turn glorify him. Honor and praising our Lord each and every day. But what is God up to ultimately? And it is this as we close out for the day. In him, again, in Christ, and there's that salvation language, as a plan, and the, the Greek word, the original language word here is oikonomos. It's where we get the word economy. The economy of God, the plan of God is this. This is what God is ultimately up to. And that is for all of time, for the fullness of time, to gather up, or in other words, to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. 
That is the ultimate economy or game plan of God, is that all may come to know Christ's love and to be united in Christ and to love him and to worship him. Yeah. So, our inheritance is a phenomenal, phenomenal gift from God. And knowing that there are 163 days, 14 hours, 22 minutes, and 37, nope, 36, well, 35 seconds. Oh, gee, now it's down to 31. Imagine that. We know that Christmas is coming. And we know that God has given these great gifts to us. Whether we claim them and live them, that's your choice and it's my choice. But why would you just want to toss it to the side or throw it on the back burner? Because when it's from God, it doesn't get any greater than that. What a great Christmas gift, 365 days a year. And knowing that these are the gifts of God Paul is sharing with us, that we in turn want to offer gifts to God. And that is to give him praise, to give him glory, and that our lives and the way that we live it can show honor to him. And whether that is by spending time with other people, if that's your love language, or whether it's doing things for other people, acts of service, if that's your love language. Or maybe it's words of affirmation, or perhaps touch. Or, as we were talking about for today, giving and receiving of gifts. But whatever your love language is, let us do it, that God will be honored and praised and glorified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.